Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest Weather Watch. Today is April 27th and today we're going to take a look at this next system rolling into the Pacific Northwest here. We'll also take a look at some of the long range models as always and we'll try to pick up any nice days that might be coming up or any thunderstorm threats we may have here in the next upcoming week or so. We'll take a brief look around the rest of the country as well. Looks like some severe weather is going to get active here going on in through Friday and then Sunday and Monday across some of the southern plains, southern and central plains here coming up. Take a brief look at that. Then we're going to take a look at some of what we can expect climate wise as we go into the summer and on into next fall and even next winter. We're going to look at a little bit of El Nino and La Nina numbers with that as well. And we'll see what the official NOAA, the NOAA forecasts say for what's coming up this summer on into fall and winter. So stick with me to the end of the video for that. Now, checking out things across the rest of the country, you can see things are relatively quiet. The fire danger still exists for some areas out here through New Mexico into Colorado. And there's still some chilly air around portions of the east. Looking at Spokane, they have the, they are famous for their uh, graphics here, the weather outlook for some chilly mornings here and then showers increasing. And then eventually we're going to get another stronger system moving in here through later this week. And we'll take a look at that in some detail as well. Taking a look here, we've got day three. This is the day I'm thinking about chasing out here. You can see there is some, there's a high chance for some severe weather there across mainly Kansas into Nebraska here. And this extends all the way down towards into northern Texas here as well. Some pretty good moisture out in front of a developing cyclone looks to be setting up here for Friday. And as we go on into later this week here too, so we look at day five and day six, and you can see that moisture is going to be hanging around mostly southern plains there with some more energy ejecting off the Rockies into that. So it is that time of year, folks. May is when these things really get going. So we are really just in the start of the severe weather season across the tornado alley out there. Now back to the Pacific Northwest here. You can see during the day today, as you saw on the infrared satellite, we did have some cumuliform clouds around, and we're going to bring some residual showers through the area today. You can't completely rule out a lightning strike. I think it would be mostly northwest of Seattle, uh, maybe what Hood Canal region, maybe up over the waters here, southern Vancouver Island. But it's a it's a very small chance. Better chance out here across Idaho and Montana. And then this next system slides through into Oregon mainly and then brings another round of thunderstorms to southern Idaho and portions of Wyoming, Montana as well. And that's a system that's eventually going to eject out over the plains and I'll probably be out there chasing that one. So join me for some live streams out there. I'll try to catch a tornado on live camera there. Looking at this there coming up Friday afternoon too. You can see this even stronger frontal system moving into the region here. It's got a pretty good precipitation shield with it. And this is going to move into Western Washington, Oregon and BC here Friday afternoon and evening. Now taking a look here, the European model, this is, let's go to the more extended run here and we can see the troughing over the region. Now there goes Thursday system through Oregon here, but it leaves Washington and British Columbia in the uh, the chilly air. So we're going to continue some residual showers around the region going on through this week. And here goes this next system. We get a frontal system moving through the area Friday along with this system here as it approaches the Washington, Oregon coast. And then the European shows just a very brief ridging scenario here before it just blasts another trough right through the region here. And then we ridge again, but these are transient ridges and these troughs just continue to march through the area all the way through early May here on the 10 day period here for the European model. And if we back out a little bit here more, we'll go to the European, the mean. So let's go to the mean. This is the trough here. There goes Thursday system. Here comes Friday system. And then you can see this is a general average of all the European runs here. So you can see it does have trophy and pretty good agreement within its own ensemble members here. And then a transient ridge. Maybe we'll get a nice day on in through early next week at some point. But troughs are never far off in this La Nina spring as we've learned. Now this is looking at the GFS here. You can see the troughing over the area now. And it just goes through the day once day. Actually, let's back up a little bit so we have a more... Uh, a run that goes out a little further. 12Z is not done yet. There goes the system Friday night to Saturday morning, transient ridge, and then good agreement with the European on dropping that next trough down through Sunday night into next Monday, then a transient ridge, maybe a nice day on the day. When would that be? That would be mostly probably 
Monday would probably not be a bad day in this scenario. You'd probably get sun breaks and residual showers. And then you get a decent day on Tuesday before this next frontal system came roaring in here mid next week and drops a very cold trough over us on into the extended on the GFS here. So yeah, we just can't get away from this troughing. It's, it's nice to mix it up a little and we do get a few nice days once in a while, but definitely the troughing is the, the main player here on our weather coming up for the next couple of weeks here. It looks like with possibly a nice day in between at times. Now, this is looking at the G, uh, the GFS, the UW GFS site, and this is kind of one of the, the neat things that they show on here. So we go into the morning hours here. You can see these blue would mark, uh, you know, cumuliform clouds, clouds on the higher terrain, and you can see these showers moving through the day on Wednesday, and that's today on into Thursday. So the overnight hours, of course, there's no sunshine. This kind of shows the solar radiation reaching the surface. You can see it's mostly sunny east of the Cascades most of this time as the system is now moving through here Thursday. You can see the, the curly Q of that low pressure system moving through southern Idaho here and keeping the showery activity across much of the Pacific Northwest. But you can see some of these areas are going to be getting sunshine while maybe area so Seattle South will be in the shower. So it just depends on where you are in a lot of these times. And that's how it kind of how it goes in spring when you've got cold air aloft. Some of these areas have nice days and sometimes you're trapped under these rain showers most of the days. And then as we look on into Friday, let's put this in a motion. You can see this next frontal system bring a nice cloud shield across the region here, especially Friday evening. So, But we might get some sunshine during the day on Friday, at least initially, before these high clouds really move in and then block out the sun on into the evening. Now, the UW GFS site does have these very high-resolution models. Too. This is the 4CAM. You can actually go higher to the one33 but this shows nicely where these areas of precipitation are supposed to be. So I like just kind of coming in here. And when you really want to check out, you can zoom into the Puget Sound or just into Oregon. And you can watch the terrain features interact with these showers. So it's, it's a very a nice tool they have here. And there's multiple different things you can look at. Now, here is probability of frozen precipitation. You can see this is the four kilometer also, and it kind of highlights the terrain features nicely of the Cascades of Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, off into Montana, Idaho, and you can see the valley there where we're not expecting any frozen precipitation. So this is a really nice tool to kind of pick out and kind of highlight just where the terrain features are and that there's not going to be any lowland snow anytime in our future, as w would be extremely rare if we were expecting lowland snow at this time of year. Now, checking this out, this is the 1.33 kilometer, and this is looking at the Puget Sound. So you can really see how it highlights some of these really uh, very detailed areas of cooler air along the shorelines. It kind of highlights the cooling effect of the Puget Sound. And as you get inland a little bit, you can see how things warm up as you get into the valleys away from the water a little bit. So it kind of highlights that. And you can see the terrain features of the Olympic Mountains here and the Cascades that stay cooler. So if you're going on a hike up on Cougar Mountain or Tiger Mountain, or if you're going up into the Cascades, this kind of shows you just a very good detail of just how chill you're going to be once you get up to the top of some of these peaks. And yeah, so th these are great tools. This again is the UW site and I linked it on a couple on a, on a video I had a, a few days ago there. So maybe I'll link it again here today. So you have access to this as well. And this goes with winds also. So this is 1.33 also very detailed. You can see if you're a mariner and you're out boating here across the Puget Sound, you can see where the winds are expected to be strongest. And you can sign to see the Southeast component across the uh, northern Puget Sound. Here you can see the little inlets and where the w winds are supposed to be stronger versus the southern Puget Sound, for example, at this time on Friday would be much weaker winds. So gives you a really good idea of what to expect. And this highlights terrain features very well as well. And this is good for windstorm time too, when you can see the surge of the wind coming up through the Puget Sound and you can time it. Sometimes this model is very accurate. Now, looking at the Climate Prediction Center, check out next six to 10 days. You can see that we are in the expected to be below normal temperatures here through the next six to 10 days across Pacific Northwest. And you can see how the Southeast is above generally. And we are supposed to be above normal precipitation across the region too. Maybe that'll help with some of the drought concerns we have in Eastern portions of the state. 
And then there is the 8 to 14 day, too. So this is the Climate Prediction Center for NOAA. You can check this out on your own, too. It's a public site. And you can see 8 to 14 days below average and above average precipitation. Now, this goes out much farther, too. This is the seasonal temperature outlook for May, June, July of 2022. You can see the above average temperatures expected across the mountainous west here. And really kind of leaves us out of us here in the immediate Puget Sound and Willamette Valley area, although it is close. And it does include eastern Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. So you can kind of see how that works out. But check this out. We're supposed to have below normal precipitation for May, June, July 2022. And now you can, you can also look out June, July, and August. You can really combine these three-month totals as you want. You can see the below average precipitation for the Pacific Northwest and above average temperatures. So we may have some warm periods during this summer too, La Nina or not. This is for July, August, September. You can see squarely over the Intermountain West here, Montana, Idaho, Utah, and the Pacific Northwest, above average expected. And then we kind of get a little bit of a break here in the Pacific Northwest for that below chances, but it is still close here. And you can see the certain areas that have above average chances. And this might indicate down through Arizona an active monsoon season. This is moisture that kind of fills in over um, when the, the terrain heats up a lot, the inner mountain or the inner area here for um, Arizona. And when you warm that up, you get this monsoon moisture that will influx into the region here. It looks like there is a signal for an increased monsoon potential there for portions of Arizona. Now, this goes all the way up to August, September, and October. And you can see above average temperatures expected and not, we don't have a wet signal yet, but this is getting way out there. This is just kind of giving you an idea what we're expecting climate wise. Um, seasonal temperature outlook for next winter, December, January, February. Look at this. They're really not sold on the La Nina yet, or it's at least not showing up um, precipitation and temperature wise just yet. This can change though. If we get higher odds for La Nina coming up here in the next few, um, you know, the next few looks at the end. So, scenario this could definitely change and we could definitely be back into chillier and wetter conditions next winter and this goes all the way out january february march so yeah you can access the site and it goes all the way out to next may in fact but of course you would take anything like this with a grain of salt now this is looking at temperature for SeaTac, la nina since 1980 el nino here and neutral and you can see for the may coming up we average about 54.4 Average temperature, mean temperature for SeaTac. But look at this, 57.5 for an El Nino year. Three degrees warmer. That's a huge difference when you're talking about mean temperature. That's significantly warmer on average on a day-to-day -day basis. And then for June also, you're 2.5 degrees warmer in June for an El Nino year than you are during a La Nina year. And this goes on into summer a bit too. July is over a degree warmer during an El Nino year. August, almost a degree warmer, but the effect is less. And then once you get towards September, which, you know, we start getting out of summertime at that point, La Nina actually averages a little bit warmer than El Nino year. And then again, that kind of goes away there in October with a La Nina year about just about a half a degree cooler. And then actually November's are a little bit warmer. And that's probably because we tend to be in a stormier pattern, more atmospheric rivers, for example, keep us a little bit warmer than an El Nino year. And then it really starts to show up again in December of an El Nino year versus La Nina. And for the most part, neutral tends to be closer to La Nina than it does El Nino as far as our data goes. But for example, during a neutral year, the May is over two degrees warmer than it is in a La Nina year, but still cooler than an El Nino year. So, yeah, if you guys want, pause this and take a look at these numbers. Again, this is from 1980 to current for SeaTac, average mean temperature. Now, here is rainfall, and you can see that, for the most part, May is quite a bit rainier on average than an El Nino year, uh, for a La Nina year, that is. So we're going into a La Nina May here. So we almost get an inch more precipitation on average. And you can see that neutral years tend to be closer to La Nina. And going through the summer, too, you can see El Nino is a little bit drier until we get to about to August. And I don't know if this is a signal because of maybe some monsoon moisture that moves up during El Nino years. That's a possibility. I have not looked into that in great detail. But you can see that August, we're much less rainy in a La Nina year than we are in El Nino. And then this starts to change rapidly as we get into September, October, November, and the mid-latitude cyclones start to roll back in. And November is significantly more rainy in a La Nina year versus an El Nino and you can see neutral years is all usually somewhere in between these two values of La Nina and El Nino. So that's what we're looking at coming up here. You know, again, it is just kind of 
a broad guess at this point, and you're kind of looking at ocean patterns, El Nino, La Nina, where we're expected to be, and that's kind of what the NOAA draws upon. And so you got to take that stuff with a grain of salt. But yeah, so enjoy the day today. You probably have some sun breaks around before this next system starts to spread clouds back over us again tomorrow and keeps us in this cooler, showery uh, pattern here for the next couple of days before a stronger system reaches us Friday. And, uh, Friday. and we saw that frontal system it brings with mm -hmm. us and that nice uh, cloud shield and nice precipitation shield it's going to bring on shore. But there is a very slight chance of a thunderstorm, I would say, around the area today, but it is much lower than yesterday, and we do not have that general thunderstorm risk across the area. The odds are probably a little bit better up towards British Columbia, where the air is a little bit colder aloft there. So yeah, enjoy the sun breaks if you get them today. Click like and subscribe, and we'll do this again tomorrow, guys.